Don't you just love Lucas? His passion. Aren't we thankful for our worship team? Yes. It's amazing. Yes. The presence of God is here, yes? yes? And when we allow the Holy Spirit to move like that, when we allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do instead of following an agenda, yes. if we say, well, it's time to do this, and then we miss what God wants to do in our lives. I believe people are healed tonight on the inside as well as yes. physically. I believe some of us woke up to a new level in God. Some of us got a new hunger and a thirst for God. And so when we do that, I just, I love, I love Wednesday nights. I never, ever want them to go away. Do you? All right. Hey, we're going to get right into the word. I'm going to just encourage you guys. If you got your Bible with you, this is, if you missed this past weekend, we've got a new tool. We're always wanting to get better. We're always wanting to, to have a, a better way to communicate God's word. And so we gave this a rip last weekend and loved it. I'm going to go ahead and use it again tonight because it was so helpful in the teaching and in exposing God's word. Plus, it lets me put a Bible in my hand instead of an iPad. And I'm an old school head. You can have an iPad. You can have a smartphone. There's no judgment. But for me, I just love holding <laughs> that leather, smelling that leather, right? All right, we're going to pray for God's word. If you've got a Bible, if you've got an iPad, a smartphone, or if you look at it there, if not, we're going to have it up on the screen. Just throw your hands up towards the screen if you don't got nothing at all. And if you've got something, just hold up there and let's make this declaration. Say, Father God, thank you for your word. For your word changes me from the inside out. It's a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. Help me today. Give me revelation. Speak to my heart. Give me something fresh so I could be better than I came in. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all ready to get in it? We got a word for you tonight. The word is rescued. Anybody ever see somebody get rescued? Anybody ever hear of somebody getting rescued? If, if, if it's even in the natural sense, of course, we're going to be talking in the spiritual sense. But today on social media, I threw up a pic. I should, probably should have brought it here and thrown it up for you guys as well. But it was this man holding a 450-pound black bear in the ocean, and he was swimming him to safety. When the man was interviewed to find out what happened, they had tried to dart the bear, and the bear resisted the, 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 the dart and ended up going out in the ocean and then started to drown. And this man, who had nothing to do with any of it, without thinking twice, he ran into the ocean, not knowing if this bear was going to maul him, if the bear would even allow him to rescue him, but he went and he ran into the ocean and he put his arm around that bear's neck and one underneath one of his arm, one of his legs, and he just pulled him and swam him all the way in to safety. And I just felt when I saw that picture and I saw, saw that story, I feel like in my heart, that's what Jesus did for me. I was this angry bear. I, I, was, I was endangering myself, and I didn't even know it. Others were endangering me, even if they didn't intend to. Are y'all here? Others had, had darted me. They had inflicted me. They had tried to, tried to drug me and make me not me. And I was out in the middle of the ocean, and I was just barely gasping for my last breath, and Jesus came, and he rescued me, and he pulled me out. He knew in his heart, of course, he's God. He has that advantage. He knew what I would do with that rescue, but the point is, is I didn't, and I didn't know how it would be even when he approached me, if he ever would approach me, and so I want to talk to you tonight about what it looks like to get rescued. How do we get rescued? Because often when we come into Christ, when we, when we come into the kingdom of God and we say yes to Jesus and we make that decision and, and we start doing some pretty cool things, but then all of a sudden we get, we get smacked with reality that just because we said yes to Jesus doesn't mean the devil goes away. It actually means he comes more. It doesn't mean the spiritual warfare stops. It actually means it's really just begun. It doesn't mean that your marriage is 100% perfect. No, now there's just a new target on it from the enemy to try to divide you, to try to make you look like a mockery for the faith that you stand in. Are y'all hearing me today? You walk into work, you know, you had a great Wednesday night, Thursday morning, you walk into work, and somebody just done ticked you off. And you let them know, right? You want to put the, the hand of fellowship or the hand of judgment to the seat of fellowship, right? You're driving into work, if you're like me, and you got to fight that all the way in. When somebody's going, today I was going, and I'm not making fun, I'm just telling you, I just, I got a belly laugh. I just came back. Today I spent a couple days with one of my pastors, one of the 
greatest leaders in America right now. He's pastoring the third largest church in America. And they're only 16 years old. They're, they're running barely, they're barely struggling to run 44,000 on the weekend. And they started 16 years ago. It's amazing what God is doing in Birmingham, Alabama with Pastor Chris Hodges. Some of you have seen some videos from him from time to time. But I was out there, got an opportunity to spend some time with him and just pull from him and, and learn from him and flew in today and drove home. And then I had to run to get a couple things done before getting into prayer time before the service. And I was driving down New Hope in Cedar Park. And, and this car was going 25 miles an hour at a steady pace. It wasn't like this, like, okay, they're texting or they're done. No, for a very long time, they were going 25 miles an hour in a 45. And my instant reaction, of course, is just want to love that. No, it's, it's, it's to want to run them off the road, right? And so I, I finally get to the two lanes. I whip my truck out around them, and I pull up on a mean mugging, you know, just act like an idiot, of course. Probably going to walk into Reach Church and hear all this. And I'm getting ready to mean mug, and I see this sweet elderly lady. She had to be deep into her 90s. Hear me now. She was leaned up with her chin <laughs> over the steering wheel. I've never seen somebody that close. And I swear to you, I'm not exaggerating. She had a pair of what looked like bird-watching binoculars strapped <laughs> to her head. And when I saw that, I'm going to tell you, if you don't got a sense of humor, man, you can't. Yeah, I just started laughing, not laughing at her, but laughing at myself. Like I'm about to get mad at an elderly lady who's like my sweet grandmother who has to wear binoculars to be able to drive down the road. But hey, she's still driving. So, so praise God for her, right? She's still out there doing it. She's not letting nobody else have to take care of her. And so I just started laughing at myself thinking, man, what the heck is your problem? This is probably 90% of the people that you get frustrated with. And in the end, but it's, it's, it's that mentality, folks, that when we get rescued from Jesus, we can tend to allow that condemnation and the accusations from others and even from the enemy begin to creep in our lives. But then this song, man, what a perfect fit for tonight with this message, and it wasn't planned like that, that he is. He's the one that rescued us. There's no shame. He's, he's the one that he paid the full price. He paid with all the pain that could be paid. And in the end, it's what I want to really do tonight is I want to walk through and talk through what it looks like. What does the rescuing process look like and what do we do with it? Because most of us in this room, if not all of us, have probably experienced that rescue moment from Jesus. And if those of you haven't, then we'll have an opportunity for you to be able to do that. But if you have, and you've experienced that like I did when I was a teenager, I had an encounter with God. I believed the message, but I just couldn't figure out how to stop doing what I was doing that wasn't of God and be able to put myself apart the best I could for God. And then even after I got truly saved and, and, and surrendered everything, with every step of the way from getting out of the Marine Corps and then wondering, God, what's next? I know where he called me. I didn't know exactly, you know, what I was going to be doing, but I knew exactly where to go. And when I went there, I was going blind, just following God, just listening to the, the faith in my heart that God had spoken. And, and when we got there, I had no idea. I had no idea what to expect. God called me out of the Marine Corps into ministry and then told me to go to World Harvest Church in Columbus, Ohio. At the time, was the largest church north of the Mason-Dixon line and east of the Mississippi River. And it was the, one of the largest in the entire nation. And he told me to go there, finish my seminary schooling, and then that was it. That's all I had in front of me. And I got there, and then the, the, the first day, I'm going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday, but the first day... The first day, God speaks to me something very prophetically and tells me something I'm not going to give it away, but I ignore it. I, don't, I, I just, I don't know how to, like that can't be God. That doesn't even, that's just so silly. I ignore it and a year later, when I was wondering what to do, I felt like all of a sudden I needed rescued again because now I've finished my school. I'm hungry. I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to go after the next generation. I wanted to, to be a youth director and build youth centers. And I had all this vision. I had vision. I, God had showed me these visions of building these youth centers. Well, the visions were so big and the buildings were so big. I had no idea how that would even be possible. I mean, it looked millions of dollars worth of buildings that God showed me to build and, and to win the next generation. And then a year, right when I'm getting ready to leave, and I'm going to go do something that God didn't tell me to do, but I was just 
desperate. I felt like I needed rescued, so I was trying to rescue myself. I was starting to doubt, not in my heart like, oh, I doubt God, but I was doubting the call that God had put on my life. And I just need to go get after it. And the day before we were, I was set to go to youth camp, Melissa had said to me, baby, I don't think we're supposed to go. I think we're supposed to stay. And I said, well, I, I'm not saying that I don't believe that, but we have an opportunity to go and we don't have an opportunity to stay. And, and I said, so we're going. And she said, what's the chance of us staying? And I said, 0.01%. <laughs> and she said, really? And I'll tell you the rest of the story in the weekend but that point zero one, that thing that I declared with my mouth came to pass three days later. It was amazing. I can't wait to tell you guys about it on the weekend. But all of that said, in the middle of this, I'm looking and I'm, I'm saying this is so crazy because this is where I'm going to be going with this message today. Is I'm looking, back, I'm, looking, I'm looking at my current circumstances and I'm frustrated that I can't move forward. I'm frustrated that I don't know what's next. I'm frustrated that I don't have the, I might have a bit of the big picture, but I surely don't have the long view, the long distance of the picture, and I'm just finding myself getting this place of frustration. And this is the key thing, though, about God and how God operates, is if you ever want to know if God is faithful, then you don't have to look for your future. What you got to do is you got to look in your past. Yeah. When you look back and you see what God pulled you out of, yeah. when you see how he forgave you and washed you as white as snow, as if you had never made a mistake of sin in your entire life, when you know that there are some things that God has done in your life that only God can do, then you don't have to sit there and want, look for and be stressed out about the future. Jesus said that. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow brings its own problems. Today has problems enough, he said. So worry about today. Focus on today, and when you need to, when you need to get the muster of strength within you, then I like to say, then we need to look, at, look in the past. What has God done? Because when I look in the past and I see what God's done in my life, then it builds faith in my life. Are you all with me? Yeah. Let's look at what the word rescued means. It means to free. This is right out of Webster's Dictionary. It means to free or deliver from confinement violence, danger, or evil. And that's a good definition. Yeah. To free me. God wants to free you, to deliver you from confinement, from being held back by sin, from being held back by your stumbling blocks, by your weaknesses. He wants to help you work on those and get stronger and stronger and better and better every day. Nobody's perfect, but we should be working on it. He wants to be able to free you, to deliver you. From the violence of, of maybe your surrounding, maybe you're in an abusive situation, you don't need to stay there. If you don't have help, come talk to us, we'll help you, I promise you. Maybe you're just feeling like a volatile, maybe it's not violent physically, but it's emotionally or just a volatile situation. Maybe it's even at work and not even in the home, but God could free you, he could rescue you from that. Yeah. From a danger. I didn't even know there was a danger in my future. I didn't know what that danger was even when somebody prophetically told me about it. When I wasn't saved and they warned me that God was trying to get a hold of my life, but there was a danger lurking in my future. And I didn't listen. I didn't. I had a hard heart. I was stubborn. And a week later, Candace is bitten by a rattlesnake. And three days later, she's about to have her leg amputated before God showed up. And he rescues us. He frees us. And he delivers us from evil. Isn't that good? Yeah. That not evil is sin evil. Yeah, sin's evil. Confinement, that's a, but evil isn't just the evil today. Remember the Lord's Prayer. Do not let me be led into temptation by the evil one. Yeah. So God is not only looking to rescue you from what you've already done, but God's looking to rescue you from what you're going to do. Yeah. Come, on. Come on now. Yeah. I thank God for the rescues of the what I was going to do. So let's look at this. We're going to look in Deuteronomy chapter 1 today. We're going to come up here first and just look at it on screen. Number one for today is this. Look at God's past. When you're looking at your situation and you're trying to figure out, let's, let's again, let's put this into a personal scenario. Maybe it's in your faith. Maybe you feel like your faith has become stagnant. It's become confined. It's become sinful. Maybe, you're, maybe it's become evil. Maybe your faith is not healthy. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's your marriage or your children or 
your boyfriend or girlfriend or friends or whoever that is, your classmates. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe you need rescued from your financial crisis. Everybody said amen, right? There's a way to do that, I promise you. I'm not going to go in depth to it, and this isn't a gimmick because I'm not going to teach on it. It's called tithing. When you tithe and give God 10%, your first 10%, then God gives you more than you could ever imagine, and you don't live paycheck to paycheck. It's, it's unimaginable to even try to explain, but that's why God said, test me on it and let me prove to you it's good. Yes. And we're not taking another offering so everybody can relax, right? <laughs> but maybe it's in your future. Maybe you had dreams, aspirations. Maybe there's something within you that you so desperately wanted to do that you felt like you were purposed to do, but you've yet to do. Maybe you feel like you got robbed from you. Maybe you feel like just you let it slip through time and time has passed it by. If we ever get in the position where we, where we feel like we could use a rescue, where we need to be rescued, where we desire to be rescued, where, where we're calling on, on God's name, where we are in a position where we have no way out but him, then the way that you build your faith is not just look to the future, that's one way, but it's also to look at God's past, not just your past, but not just even your past in God. That's why we have the Bible. Yeah. That's why... The hall of faith is written in Hebrews. That's why the book is filled with stories of faith because when we look and see what God has done for masses of people, for nations, for millions upon millions, then why can't he do it for us? Why won't he do it for us? Are y'all here? So you guys know the story of the Israelites. I'll just recap it real quick and then we're going we're gonna to rip through this because this is a critical part to it. So we're talking about being rescued. We're talking about being freed, being delivered from confinement, from violence, from danger, and from evil. Well, the way the Israelites journey, most people don't realize how did they end up being held as slaves in Egypt. Well, the truth was there's a great famine that struck the land. And Jacob, who is the father of the Israel, his name is Israel, He had all these sons, and one of them was his favorite. And the brothers are jealous. So they plotted to kill him, then to sell him into slavery, to leave him to die. They had all these crazy plans for him, and they ended up selling him as a slave. He ended up going to Pharaoh's palace after a long story. I'm going to cut it super short. He goes to a a prominent man's house, gets accused of something he doesn't do, and then gets thrown in jail. Everywhere he goes, he prospers him. Everywhere he goes, he gives him his best. He doesn't complain. He doesn't whine about it. He just gives him his best. You would think he would complain after he was sold into slavery. You would think he would complain about being accused of rape and he didn't do it. You think he would complain then about being thrown in prison for something that he never did, but he never said a word. You know what he became? The model citizen in the prison system. Everybody wanted to be around. Everybody wanted to be around Joseph. Everybody wanted to touch him. Everybody wanted to to hear him. And he started interpreting dreams. And before you know it, he ends up interpreting Pharaoh's dream. And it's all about the the famine that's about to come. And Pharaoh ends up appointing him to be second in command. Today it would be like in the world, the vice president of the United States of America. He was the second most powerful man. He went from the pit to the palace. And there was a key there, and we're going to hit on it in a minute. So while he's there, the famine strikes, and his family comes looking for food. They don't know it's him. His brothers come. He ends up revealing himself to him after a while, and then he ends up bringing the whole nation of Israel to Egypt, and they're allowed to eat off the storehouses of food that he is the one that was responsible to figure out how to, how to reap all this harvest to keep it for the famine, and Israel was a celebrated, the, the Jewish culture was a celebrated thing in Egypt for a full generation. But when that generation passed off and the next Pharaoh came into power, he didn't want to honor them. So he saw a way to build his pyramids, and so he put every one of those Israelites into slavery. So they started off bad, got a huge break, and then out of the huge break, they end up getting the worst condition they've ever experienced up at that point. You want to talk about confinement, they were slaves. They were imprisoned against their own will. Violence, they were beaten and whipped and forced to build these pyramids. Danger... Everything about their life was in danger, and it was all done by an evil emperor, evil pharaoh. 
And so if anybody needed a rescue, the nation of Israel needed a rescue. And God shows up. He brings Moses in to deliver. Moses comes in. He challenges Pharaoh. God's signs and wonders come, the plagues and all the crazy stuff that's happening. Pharaoh finally lets God's people go. They're crossing through the Red Sea. He parts the Red Sea for them to pass. I mean, just imagine this. He takes you out of slavery, and then he takes you through a miraculous Red Sea, massive sea being parted in two, and then Pharaoh changes his mind, chases them down, and after they get through and the Pharaoh's army's coming through, the waves come back in and swallow up Pharaoh's army and destroys it all. And now these guys are free. And not only that, but God has promised them this amazing place that flows with milk and honey. This amazing place where the grapes are as big as a human head. This amazing place where nothing is in lack, everything is in prosperity. God has given them a piece of land. And this is where we pick up because here's the problem. Is they were on this journey and they got stuck. Some people like to say they got lost. They, they got lost, but it was intentional loss on God's part. For 40 years, they stayed in the wilderness. For 40 years, they were homeless. Millions of people homeless in the wilderness for 40 years. And this is the key. Most people can't figure out why. We're going to see why today. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 2 says, normally it takes only, everybody say those next two words together, 11 days. Whoa. Normally it takes only. Only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, which is where they were at at this moment. So they're already now in Kadesh Barnea, but they are there 40 years later. And Moses is speaking to the people and saying, guys, normally it only takes 11 days to get here. And it took us 40. If you want to get real, real, you say 40, right? Look at verse 3. But now it has been 40 years. Oh, my goodness. I'm telling you right now, just God, let it end. Take my life. 11, I mean, can you imagine an 11-day journey going into your promise out of your captivity? You've been rescued by God. He has performed all these amazing, mighty miracles. He's done all these incredible things in and through your life and for your life. And now, all of a sudden, they feel like God's just abandoned them out in the middle of the wilderness for 40 years. And they finally get to the precipice of their breakthrough. They're on the other side of the Jordan about to cross over the Jordan River to go into their promise 40 years later. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know you would be frustrated. You can't wait 40 extra seconds at Chick-fil-A drive through on a Saturday morning without getting frustrated. Or is that just me? Spicy chicken biscuits, man. They get me every time. Look at this. Look at what it says. But now he has, everybody say the next word, rescued. But now he has rescued you. This is Moses telling God's people. Now he has rescued you and brought you to this place. So the rescue process took 40 years when it should have only taken 11 days. He took them out of Egypt. He rescued them out of their place of bondage. He took them out of their addiction. He took them out of their abuse. He took them out of their weakness. Are you hearing me now? He took them out of their infighting, their arguing. He took them out of their lack, their poverty. He took them out of whatever. The, he took them out, but now they're out for 40 years instead of just 11 days. But why? Verse 29, I'm going to jump down to it. I'm going to read it to you, then we'll jump back on the screen here. Verse 29 says this, but I said to you, don't be shocked or afraid of him. Speaking of he sent the spies into the promised land and they got freaked out because the, there was giants in the land. So they come back complaining again. He said, don't be shocked or afraid of them. The Lord your God is going ahead of you. He will fight for you just as you saw him do in Egypt. What did we just talk about? Look what's happening. Moses is reminding the people, look at the past. You want to know what God's going to do for your future? Then look at your past. Look what God has already done and know that he's going to do even greater things. 
And you saw how the Lord your God cared for you all along the way as you traveled through the wilderness, just as a father cares for his child. And then look at this. Now he has rescued you and brought you to this place. But even after all he did, here comes the why. Why did it take 40 years to make an 11 day journey? Here it is. But even after all that he did, you refused to trust the Lord your God. God took them out. He had a plan to bring them in. He took them out of slavery, out of bondage. He took them out of violence, out of danger, out of evil. He took them out. And his plan was 11 days later to take them in. But something happened along the way. And here's how quick it happened. It happened first at the foothill of the, of the Red Sea before God split it. They started complaining, oh, look what you've done, Moses. You've led us out of Egypt just to lead us to the sea. So now we can all be slaughtered and drowned in the sea. And then God splits the sea. Oh, okay. That wasn't the plan. And they go through it. And as soon as they get on the other side and the army is swallowed up behind them, they immediately begin to complain. Yeah. Hear this now. This is so key for tonight. You want the full rescue process to have its way in your life? Then you have to. You must. I implore you, stop complaining. Get negative speaking out of your language. Especially when we're talking about the things of God. I was reading some complaints today in these stories a guy drove through a Wendy's and held up the drive through at gunpoint. And then later he got home, he counted his stash, and he found out it was barely anything. So he called them up and complained to them about not keeping enough money in the drawer for when he robs them. That wasn't as bad as the guy who went in and robbed the bank, asked for $20,000 at gunpoint, went home, the cashier shortchanged him, $19,200. You know what he did? He walked back into the bank two hours later to demand the other 800 And he got arrested. And he's in prison. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. There's the, the girl that went to India. She went to India for vacation. And she complained on Facebook. Is this all true? Yes, this is all true stories. There's no jokes here. She went to India. My wife's thinking there's a shoe drop and there's not. She went to India... She went to India on vacation, and she wrote on Facebook, it's a beautiful place, but it's, it's, the food is so stinking hot. It's India. They eat hot food. The guy went to Australia, and he was complaining about how thick the soup was, and it was because he was eating their gravy at the table. <laughs> this is the best one. A lady spent $1 on the lottery and hit, hit for $36 million. When she found out that they were gonna take over 50% of it and she was only gonna have $17 million left, she called up a complaint and said, she took it, but at first she said, I don't even want it, you could just keep it after all that you're gonna take. <laughs> you spent a dollar, lady. You got $17 million. Are you hearing me? It's so easy for all of us to fall into that trap of looking at what we don't have, what God didn't do, what God hasn't done yet, instead of looking in the back and saying, but man, look what God has done. And if he's done that in my past, from glory to glory, stronger and stronger, better and better. The latter days are greater than the former days. So whatever he's done in my past, he plans to do better in my future. But God, he doesn't play the complaining game. 40 years. 11-day journey took 40 years. God wasn't playing around. God wasn't happy. Listen to this. I'll just read on out of here. Verse 33. He said... Your God, he goes before you looking for the best places to, to camp, guiding you with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. When the Lord heard your complaining, hear this now, verse 34, when the Lord heard your complaining, he became very angry. So he solemnly swore, not one of you from this generation will live 
to see the good land I swore to give your ancestors. Except Caleb. Except Caleb. Why did he say except Caleb? Watch this now. And here's why he tells us. He will see this land because he has followed the Lord completely. He didn't give up on God. He didn't get in that complaining mode. He didn't get in that doubting Thomas mindset. He didn't say, well, I know God's done this, but yet this hasn't happened. He said, I'm thankful for what God has done, and I'm going to keep on following him for what he will do. Yes. Right? So this is amazing what, what has happened. He's, 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 he's seeing this. Yeah. He's seeing this as a way to break through. So Caleb gets promised, and it goes on to say, I will give him the descendant, his, and his descendants some of the very land he explored during his scouting mission. And then verse 37, and the Lord was so angry with me, Moses, because of you, he said to me, Moses, not even you will enter the promised land. Instead, your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will lead the people into the land. So the only two guys that got to go were Joshua, his assistant, his second in command, and Caleb. But here's the key to it. The Lord was so angry, hear this now, with me because of you. The Lord was so angry with your wife because of the husband. How does that make sense? It means that your negativity, your complaining affects those around you. It doesn't just hurt your life. It doesn't just stop your life. It hurts everybody around you. It stops everything around you. It holds everything into a holding pattern until you're in the wilderness long enough where hopefully you say, God, forgive me. The Israelites did that. He would move them forward, and then they'd start complaining again. He was feeding them food from heaven that nobody else on the earth has ever had the privilege of eating called manna. It's the food of angels. He was feeding that to them, and they started to complain about, it. oh, manna again? Manna, manna, manna. Bobana, foo, foo, right? <laughs> Hear this now. Now watch what he says, though. I love God. He says this to Moses. Now go encourage him. Joshua, you're second in command. Yeah, you're not getting to go, Moses, because you allowed the people to do this, but now you're going to go encourage him. You might have missed your moment, but that don't mean that you got to let the next generation miss theirs. Go encourage them. For he will lead Israel as they, as they take possession of it. Are you hearing me? Yeah. This is good stuff. We want to look at what God has already done to understand and know that God is going to be faithful and just to do it even more on the next time around. So that was number one is we got to look back, right? We got to look back and see what God has done. What is, what is God's past? I want to look at God's past. Number two... It's simple. We're going to look at God's promise. I don't want to just look at God's past. I want to look at God's promise. Yes, I need to look back and get faith from what he has done. For me, for others, I just heard faith stories this week sitting with my pastor and some, some of my, my, my friends in, in, in ministry and, and, and hearing what God is doing in their churches and hearing what God is doing in their cities. And so most people feel like, and, and I'm going to pause and just kind of go back just for 30 seconds here on the first one. We're looking at our nation. Our nation is in trouble. I'm telling you flat out. You better vote. I'm not telling you how to vote. You vote with your heart, but you better vote and you better pray. And you, better fa and you better be ready to be the church because no matter which way this thing goes, the church is about to be needed more than it's ever been needed in America except for the founding forefathers when they founded it. And that's good news for us. Because we're not going to be sissified and sit back and just hope everybody likes us and we don't offend. We're, gonna not, we're not going to go out in soapboxes and offend the whole world. We're going to be the light to the darkness. We're going to be the salt to the earth. We're going to be a city set on the side of the hill. God is preparing us. Do you know the land that we just bought is on the top of a mountain and overlooks the hill country? Just throw that out there for you. City set on the side of the hill. This is what God is doing. So we want to know that, yeah, 
I can look and say things are a mess and you look at anything that's going on in the world, it's chaos. And you look at the politicians right now and it's just, you can't even wrap your mind around it. It's just mind blowing every second of every day. And you have to just say, I'm going to say it once and I'll never say it again. Is this honestly the best that America has to offer in these two candidates? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe this is where we need to be to have the church wake up because here's the truth all the way throughout scripture. Whenever the nation prospers, the church wanes. Because people don't need God, because they got money. But when the church, when the nation suffers, the church rises, because we're under persecution from the enemy, from the government, for whoever it would be, and we could rise in those moments. And again, I'm not here to talk politics. I honestly, here's my take: I don't give a rip about politics. I give a rip about Jesus and about you and about the lost souls that are in this city, in this region, and in Clean that we're going to reach one by one, one after the other, over and over again. That's what we should care about, right? So we got to look at God's promise. Let's, let's whiz through this. We're running out of time. Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 12. Listen to what it says. For thus says the Lord your God, behold, I, and then he repeats it, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have scattered. He's letting us know. Look at this. He's telling us, behold, he himself, he's not going to leave it up to an angel. He's going to come looking for you himself. He's not going to leave it up just anybody. He's going to take care of you himself. And look at this. So will I seek out my sheep and I will, everybody say the next word together, rescue. I will rescue them from all places. How many places? all places. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, there's a rescue plan already put in action. There's a rescue plan God has already done. All we got to do is condition our heart in the right place and surrender to him to allow that plan to come to pass. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. This is the hour we live in. Thick darkness. Clouds. What does that mean? Confusion. Can't see straight. Can't go. That was another complaint, by the way. A mother was on an airplane and complaining about the clouds in the sky to the, to the flight attendant because her kids wanted to play spy games in the sky and they needed to see down to the earth to play that, right? But in clouds and in thick darkness, this is the hour we live in, this is the time we live in, God's about to rescue us. God's about to rescue his church. God's about to do something amazing. I'm telling you right now, revival is absolutely imminent. All that we got to do is continue to position ourselves with the right heart, with a contrite heart, with a heart that's hungry for God, that's willingness to ask that we talked about last week, that's willing to, to ask forgiveness of the things that we've done wrong and willing to repent even of the things that we're going to do and still repent on the behalf of those that haven't even affected us but have affected us as a whole. When we put ourselves, when we humble ourselves, and when we pray. God will hear our prayers, and he will heal our land. He will rescue us. God is in the rescuing business. So we want to look at God's past. Then we want to look at God's promise. And then the last one, we're wrapping it up. Then we will look at God's plans. What has God got planned for us? Look at this. Psalm 40, verse 2. He lifted me up out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on the rock. That's Jesus. And he steadied me as I walked along. So he took you out of the miry clay and set your feet on a rock to stay. Why? Because he cares for you, because he wants to help you get a fresh start, a new beginning. He's given you a moment to be able to be stable, to be able to gather your bearings, to catch your balance, to find your center. And then look what he says. And then he says, but then he steadies you as you walk along. What does that mean? He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. That's his plan. Hell, the old footprints in the sand. He's not abandoning you. He's not taking you out just to leave you in the wilderness. That's up to you. Your length in the wilderness is up to you. It's up to your heart condition. It's up to your stinking thinking getting rid of. It's up to your openness to be able to be used by God, to follow God. The openness that we have in our heart for God to pour his spirit within us. This is what God is looking for. Yeah. When we're like Caleb. And we follow God. 
we'll make that journey in our 11 days instead of 40 years. But when we're like the masses and we complain about what we don't have, what we did have, what we could have, what we should have had, then we end up getting stuck out in the wilderness in our desert place, our dry season. How many of you have ever experienced a dry season in your life where you feel like, I don't even know where God is right now? God's always there. It's you that needs to, to get found, right? It's you that needs to find your way, find your path in God. So God is telling us, they live, what am I telling you? Here's what I'm telling you. God brought you out to take you in. God didn't bring you out to leave you hanging. God didn't bring you out to, to just walk away. God didn't bring you out just to say, well, look what I did. I performed a miracle in your life. I took you out of that old life of hurt, pain, shame, guilt, all that stuff. I took that weight off you. Now, deuces, have a good life. Hope you make it. We'll see you in heaven if you get there. That's not God's plan. That's not God's way. That's not God's method. God brought you out to take you in. Come on now. He brought you out of whatever you was in to take you in, to take you into what? A life of prosperity, a life of health, a life of healing, a life of gifts flowing in your, in your life, a life of you making a difference, a life of knowing God, a life of finding freedom, a life of discovering purpose, and a life of making a difference in your society, in your workplace, in your neighborhoods, in your families, in your loved ones. God wants to use you to make a difference. Are y'all here? He took you out to take you in. He didn't take you out just to leave you hanging. He said he's going to walk with you. He took you out of that miry clay and he set your feet on that rock to stay and then he guided you and he stabilizes you all along the journey. That's why it says the righteous fall down seven and they get up eight because he's right there to help you back up. He, he, don't, he don't let you fall down like, oh, man, you're clumsy. I'm, I'm out. Right? No, he's more like, oh, come on, son. Come on, daughter. I'm so proud of how much you've done. I'm so proud of how hard you've tried. I'm so proud of all that you've accomplished at this point. But don't let this mishap keep you down. You're never down. You're either up or you're on your way back up. Perspective. Are you hearing me? This is what God wants for each and every one of our lives. He has brought us out to take us in to something that is so amazing that we can't even truly wrap our mind around it. What God wants to do with your life is breathtaking. What God will do with your life, it's unspeakable. I could never imagine in a million years that God would be using my life to do what I'm doing now, and I know this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Pastor Chris Hodges, he just prophesied over us, over our church. He said, Chris, what you're doing there is amazing what God is doing. Your people, Elaine's been out here, has told them all about it. Others have been out here. He said, I'm so proud. He said, but listen, you've bought land now. He said, once you, fin- you, once you finalize that deal and you break ground, something spiritual is going to happen in your city. Something spiritual is going to happen in your entire region. Because now you're staking claim. We're not just a church in a strip center renting. Now we are here to stay. We're not going nowhere. And that's going to make a difference in the spiritual realm as well in the natural realm of reaching people. And I believe this, folks. The future is amazing. I believe we'll win tens and tens of thousands of people to Jesus. Hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus in Austin and Colleen and all throughout northern Texas and all the parts of the nation. I mean, God is doing so many amazing things. I'll just tell you about one more really cool thing. I had a young couple that I was, Melissa and I were her assistant youth pastor. We were assistant youth pastors. I was still in the Marine Corps, active duty, and and we were serving the church in that role. And we just, family just really gravitated to us, and we loved them, but then when we got out and moved away, we kind of lost touches before, really before cell phones. So this is way back in the day, right? So this is before cell phones and social media and all that. 12 years later, no, I'm sorry, I think it was not 12 years, 12 years later today. It was seven years later that she got a hold of me. No, it was, it was 12 years later that she got a hold of me and she said, you and Melissa have made the greatest impact in my life above anyone else and I'm now marrying a United States Marine and I'm asking you, will you do my wedding? And we went to North Carolina right outside my old Marine Corps base and when I performed that wedding, it was a great time. They've been here to reach church a bunch. They watch us online a bunch. And now God's starting to do something in their heart. And they called me up the other day. I was in South Carolina doing a wedding from a couple here at Reach Church. And when I was there, God said, you're going to plant in the Carolinas. Reach Church is going to plant churches in the Carolinas. And then I got home when three days later, I get a text 
from them and they said, God, stir in our heart. We need to talk to you. And they said to me what they said. They said, we don't want to be a church planning senior pastor. What we want to do is bring Reach Church to North Carolina and be the campus pastor. Whatever you need us to do, we're in. We're already building a team. We'll get everything together. We just want to be able to do this. This is what God's doing. It's amazing. It's incredible. You can't. You can't make that stuff up, but I'm gonna tell you, before this landing, before that 21 days of prayer and fasting, I was starting to feel like the devil was trapping me into a negative thought pattern. And I put that as my personal goal before God. God, I wanna be pure hearted before you. I don't know anything but you. I don't know how to follow anymore anyone but you. God, I want you. And now God's blowing the roof off the place and doing amazing things. This is the way God works. When we position our heart with him, he took us out to take us in. And God's gonna take you into something amazing and incredible. Do you believe that? Can we just thank him for his word today? I'm gonna speak a blessing over your life and then the prayer team's gonna be up front. If you got any need in your life, you're going through anything right now, you just feel like you need somebody to talk to, somebody to pray with you, come up and join with them. If you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, maybe you don't even know what that is, come up and ask them, talk to them about it. It's nothing to be worried about or weirded out about. It's, it's the power of the living God living through our lives in a dynamic way. Come up and ask them about it and they'll pray with you right there. We're gonna pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for Reach Church as a whole, God. And I especially thank you for those, God, that they take their time out of their schedule, God. Their kids are busy. Everything's busy and crazy right now, but they want more of you. They're here today. They want more of you. They came out tonight because they want more of you. So, Father, I pray right now that you would pour out more of you. I speak now upon each and every one of your lives, upon your marriages, upon your faith walk with Jesus. I declare over your finances. I declare over your future, over your purpose. I declare prosperity. I declare provision. I declare overflow. I declare increase in Jesus' name. I pray for more of God to be poured out and in and through your life than you've ever experienced before. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. We love you. I'll see you at the lobby or we'll see you this weekend.